Welcome back. In these next couple uh, of mini lectures, I want to focus my attention on probably what is my favorite uh, of the topics to discuss when talking about criminal defendant rights, uh, and that is the Eighth Amendment protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, this issue has almost always revolved around the death penalty, and so the question being considered uh, when dealing with the Eighth Amendment, is the death penalty cruel and unusual? Uh, certainly, I think it can be. Uh, for example, when Florida's electric chair, Old Sparky, uh, would regularly malfunction, uh, that certainly would seem to be cruel and unusual. Or when Oklahoma botched an execution by not uh, going through the appropriate procedure and mixing uh, the drug cocktail wrong and it caused an excruciating death. Uh, there have been a few Supreme Court justices that have made the argument that the death penalty is inherently uh, cruel and unusual and by that, by its very nature. Uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, was one of these justices who believed that the death penalty, no matter what the means, no matter what the mechanism, the death penalty was cruel and unusual by its very nature. But the vast majority of Supreme Court justices have not uh, made that claim. Even other Supreme Court justices that oppose uh, the death penalty. And so uh, in my case, uh, I am an opponent of the death penalty, uh, but I'm one of those people who does not believe that the death penalty is inherently cruel and unusual. Uh, once again, I, I, I believe that the reason that it's cruel and unusual is because I do not believe that the death penalty has been applied uh, in a uniform manner uh, and that the death penalty uh, has been very discriminatory in nature. If you follow along in your notes, the first uh, observation in the notes uh, is an important one for me, and that is that uh, most uh, executions that occur in our country uh, occur in the South. From January 1st, 1977 until April 15th, 2016, Texas was the runaway leader uh, in executions at 537. Oklahoma was second at 112, Florida third at 111, followed by Missouri. Uh, by the way, the state of California had 13 executions during that time period. So contrast that with Texas. And so you see this real regional variation. Uh, the vast majority uh, of executions uh, occur in the southern part uh, of this country. Uh, Western states are not very likely to execute. The Western state that has the most executions is the state of Arizona. Think back to when I was talking about federalism and I was talking about political culture and Elazar's view of the states. And I mentioned that Arizona has a very unusual political culture. It's a kind of a political schizophrenic, that it has a traditionalistic, moralistic culture, which is contradictory. Traditionalistic, you want to keep things uh, the same. Uh, you want to maintain tried and true institutions with a moralistic culture. You want to be innovative. You want to change things. You want to empower the people. So when it comes to executions, the state of Arizona in many ways looks like a southern state. Uh, Arizona has had more than three times the number of executions that California has had since 1977. So it looks much more southern than it does Western. The second overview uh, is that the United States is very unusual in that uh, modern democratic countries simply do not execute people on a widespread basis. And, and most uh, advanced industrial democratic countries in the world have abolished the death penalty. So I made a listing for you. Uh, of the top 10 countries in the world in terms of executions. And if you listen to these 10 countries, these are the countries uh, that we usually have problems with. We, we say that these are the human rights abusers. Uh, these are the countries 
uh, that we have on a whole variety uh, of bad boy listings, whether it's human rights violations uh, or whether it's censorship or persecutions or whatever it happens to be. So listen to the top 10 countries in the world and follow along. Uh, this is number two in your notes. The top 10 countries in the world for executions, uh, the People's Republic uh, of China is number one. Iran is number two, followed by North Korea, Yemen. The United States is number five. Then Saudi Arabia, Libya, Syria, Bangladesh, and Somalia. So the other nine countries in the world are authoritarian regimes. They are very politically repressive, and they also lead the world in execution. So we're in bed with uh, some countries that simply do not look very good uh, around the world. Uh, by the way, a related uh, note, although it's not directly related to the death penalty, is that the United States has by far uh, the most people languishing in prison uh, of any country in the world. Uh, we have 50% uh, more people in prison than the People's Republic of China, who is second. Uh, even though China has four times the population of the United States. So uh, we imprison a lot of people and we execute a lot of people. Uh, third, uh, the death penalty is a case study of American federalism. Once again, federalism allows states to do differently, uh, things differently, and here is a great example. Uh, currently, 31 states uh, allow the death penalty uh, and 19 states do not. Uh, there has been a, a trend, but a very slow trend, uh, about one state every five or six years or so, uh, abolishing the death penalty. When I first started teaching, I believe 37 states had the death penalty. Now it's down uh, to 31. So in a 30-year teaching career, six states have abolished the death penalty. Interestingly, the last state in America to abolish the death penalty is a state that I never would have guessed would have abolished the death penalty. It is a very conservative Republican state, and you would associate that with being very traditionalistic and with maintaining the death penalty. Uh, and, and the state that abolished the death penalty uh, was the state of Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska in this particular case, gave a couple of reasons for wanting to abolish the death penalty. One is the state legislature was dominated by conservative religious uh, individuals who did not believe that the state should be in the machinery of death, that they should not be doing that. Uh, second, it was an economic decision. Uh, the state of Nebraska uh, looked at the research and the studies and found that it is far cheaper for a state to keep someone in prison for life than to go through the lengthy appeals process and a very costly appeals process to execute. Now, personally, I do not believe that economics or, in this case, religious conviction should be the determiner as to whether or not the death penalty exists or not. Uh, but the point is, is that sometimes, uh, sometimes conservatives and liberals can come to a very different opinion uh, about an issue and argue it for different reasons. And I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, when I had my political talk show in Merced, the engineer uh, knew that I wanted to do a radio show uh, on the death penalty. Uh, the engineer was for the death penalty, by the way, and he knew I was opposed to it. So uh, he uh, decided to surprise me by inviting one of my colleagues uh, to come and be on the show and to have a, quote, discussion debate. And uh, my colleague was a, a very conservative, is, he's still my colleague, uh, a very conservative uh, individual. Uh, he had uh, guested on another radio show on the same channel, 
And so based on that, the engineer believed that my colleague would be in favor of the death penalty and that this might create some sparks in the radio studio. To the engineer's surprise, when my colleague got there and uh, we started talking about the death penalty, the engineer was surprised that my very conservative Republican colleague was also opposed to the death penalty. And my colleague was opposed to the death penalty for religious reasons. Uh, my colleague is a very conservative, very traditional Catholic who believed that the execution of people and the taking of human life was immoral. And so the engineer started to uh, uh, kind of mutter under his breath, this is going to be a horrible show because you're both uh, opposed to the death penalty. And I said, oh, no, this is going to be a great show because we oppose the death penalty for very, very different reasons. So let's go on with this. This is going to be an even better show than it would have been had he been opposed. And certainly uh, the audience, I think, was intrigued that a conservative and a so-called liberal, although I think of myself more as a moderate uh, than as a liberal, uh, but in, in this particular case, uh, my colleague was arguing uh, kind of this religious argument that you saw in Nebraska uh, and how based on his religious faith, he did not believe that the death penalty uh, should take place, that it was immoral. And I raised the argument, I raised a couple of arguments. The main one was that I believe the death penalty violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and I'm going to really get into this argument on the next mini-tape. But essentially the argument was that different groups are being given the death penalty in very uh, different ratios. Uh, for example, most executions occur in the South, and Southern states are much, much, much more likely to execute uh, non-whites than whites. Uh, and so I believe that it violates the Equal Protection Clause. I also said that I believe the death penalty uh, is an inconsistency in American justice. Uh, we often talk about with the death penalty that it offers retribution, uh, it offers an eye for an eye, uh, and certainly uh, the argument is, is that it may offer deterrence. Now certainly if the death penalty did deter uh, murder, this would be a powerful argument for it. Uh, I don't believe that it is a deterrent. And, and most importantly, I don't understand this notion of retribution. Because with any other crime, we do not uh, buy into this argument of an eye for an eye. For example, uh, we don't burn down the houses of arsonists. We don't rape rapists. And yet somehow, uh, we think that the execution of people who have engaged in murder uh, somehow uh, promotes justice, uh, when in fact uh, I don't believe that at all. Now in the next mini tape, uh, the Supreme Court has been highly divided on the issue of the death penalty. Uh, there have been cases where by a very narrow margin, five to four, uh, the Supreme Court uh, has struck down the death penalty uh, for being uh, arbitrary uh, in this particular case and very random. Uh, Thurgood Marshall once uh, ruled the death penalty is like a bolt of lightning, striking one and not another without rhyme or reason. Uh, and yet in other cases, the Supreme Court uh, has allowed the death penalty, that the death penalty is not per se unconstitutional. And if the death penalty is administered fairly, uh, that it is okay. Uh, the Supreme Court has been much more conflicted over the death penalty than, say, the American public has. The American public has consistently supported the death penalty. There has been some erosion in support in recent years for the death penalty. But the death penalty politically is still good politics. For politicians to be for it, uh, this is a vote getter and a vote gainer. And yet I do not believe that good politics should be a reason for the death penalty. I will resume this soon.